amazing. Thank you very much. Um, but, so these slides, by the way, they go every 15 seconds, and I was unaware that the intro slide was included in that. Um, just so you're aware, I bought this poncho for this evening. I didn't know what to do as my opening slide, so I asked Sam, who actually uh, does a lot of our blogging, and he said, put a weasel up there. And so that's what I did. This is our happy, we're getting started, weasel. And uh, we're here to bring people that are unique and do something a little bit different. I was just looking for random um, ads from the 70s, and I found out you get special ass-kicking pants. <laughs> or at least you could about 40 years ago. The way this is structured is that each presentation will have 20 slides. They advance every 15 seconds. And so it comes out to five minutes for those of you that can't do math, much like myself. Um, the speakers don't have any control about it, so they just have to keep going. What's important tonight is that they are not aiming for perfection. They think they are, but they're not. They need to be awesome, and you are part of that in supporting them and being here and applauding because we really like interaction. Um, I swear sometimes. I was actually thinking a little bit about tonight's uh, talks, and I don't think there's a whole bunch of adult content, so I might just drop F-bombs to make this entire slide valid. Yeah. Uh, this is, Cookie is here uh, to make sure that our speakers don't shill to you or try and sell you shit, because that's not the purpose of this evening. It's just to learn things and to have a good time, and if people start doing that, I'm gonna be an ass. I'm here tonight to talk to you about why I love November. Um, first being that it snowed last night, which makes me super duper happy. And uh, it's almost the end of the year, and I'm still that person going, it's already November, that's crazy. And this is something that we get a lot, especially from people that are new. Who here has just moved here in the last like three years? Yeah? All right, yeah, this is not surprising. Um, and for those of you that have lived here a long time, really don't be surprised. We'll still put memes out about it every time it snows and then it's sunny the next day, but that's pretty much how it is here all the time. Tell your friends not to move here. Um, <laughs> when it gets a little bit colder, I become knit obsessed. So uh, right now, I just started a sweater yesterday, nervous knitting in preparation for tonight's talk. Uh, I'm also learning how to crochet, but I can only do scarves. Uh, November is also really important to me because of NaNoWriMo, National Novel Writing Month, and also Movember. My, I bring that up because my brother has participated in this for several years, and it's supporting men's health, and I think it's impressive. Feel free to read one of these slides while I also tell you that there are more serial killers born in November than any other month in the year. And these are my two favorite jokes that I found in the recent history, and Pun Husky's just the best. Plus, it's the 5th of November, so Guy Fox, who's seen V for Vendetta or read history book ever? Yeah, so I really, okay, let's be honest, I did this because a slide kicked ass. Also, I really love November because of just being thankful and having a lot of gratitude. This is my family. My daughter, Lily, if you've been here before, you've seen pictures of her. And that's our fantastic Olin Mills picture that I did uh, with my husband. And I'm also super thankful for everybody that is volunteering and making sure tonight happens because this is a really amazing family that has made me a better person, which sounds hokey, but it's true. Yay, uh, yay us! Uh, another reason that November is amazing is because of the Macy's Parade. I know there are more commercials than Parade now, but I still really enjoy it, and I really wanted to be a Rockette when I was little. That was a big deal, and I didn't know that you had to, like, kick at a particular height, which I'm not going to try to do now. Another reason why November is amazing is because Jenny Lawson's going to be here next week. If you haven't heard about the Blogus, go look her up because she's amazing, and uh, she just put out Furiously Happy. She'll be a tattered cover next Wednesday if you want to see me. All of these people have birthdays in November. Shirley Chisholm, Marie Curie, Bram Stoker, Jimi Hendrix, Astrid Lindgren, Georgia O'Keeffe, Carl Sagan, Mark Tw Miley Cyrus, yeah, Tina Turner, and me. I, uh, I turned, thank you, thank you. I, uh, I had to take a lot of selfies to really nail it. I turned 40 on the 18th, so feel free to buy me a beer. 
I'm super excited. And you know what? That's it. That is how an Ignite presentation goes. I'm sweating like a mother. Um, so that's it. Next, though, you got to see the real speakers that had to uh, put a lot of work and uh, effort into these. Amanda Yull is going to be our first talk of the night with Blow Up Your Life, figuratively speaking. Um, I, I got some fun facts from her. I know that she wishes she could do roller derby, but she hasn't, and that her favorite live music performance was every Nick Cave concert ever. I believe that's how it went. And now you get to walk out here carefully. Get back and forth across the stage about 14 times tonight without falling. I better get a shitload of high fives. So please give Amanda a big hand. I've got a confession to make. I love to blow shit up. So much so that I made a career out of it. I spent just over a decade in the mining explosives industry doing research and marketing. But after a while I started to realize that rocks weren't the only thing I liked to blow up. I started to notice that every three or four years I'd take a part of my life and I'd blow it to pieces. From careers to relationships to where I made my home in the world, it seemed like nothing was sacred. You might be thinking I just like a bit of drama in my life, and that's probably fair, but, <laughs> but what I was learning is that in order to take a bold leap forward, you've got to tear something down from the past. So when we think of explosions, we tend to conjure images of chaos and destruction, but that's not what I see. What I see is that we're taking some starting materials that have an enormous amount of potential energy. We're giving them a bit of a kickstart, and we're creating something even bigger and better than before. So let's think about how that works. So starting with energy, right? Energy can either be taken very literally, so the number of joules that something has in it, or it can be taken as something more personal and ephemeral, like the energy that we burn up inside of us or that we choose to put out into the world. Now, when you think of an explosive, an explosive is only two things. It's a fuel and an oxidizer. And right now, those two things are really innocuous. They're just going to sit there and look at you. But what they do have is an enormous amount of potential energy. That is energy that hasn't been unleashed yet. And it's a lot like when a diver goes and gets ready to jump off the diving board. Okay? So in our lives, that fuel represents the skills that we've accrued over a lifetime. And the oxidizer, that represents our passions, the things that light us up. Every one of you out there has skills. We all acknowledge that. Every one of us has passions as well. And one of the things that we often do is either ignore these altogether or we forget to mix them together. Because until you mix a fuel and an oxidizer together, you haven't got an explosive. You've just got two beakers of stuff. So when you've mixed your fuel and your oxidizer together, to get it to go bang, you're going to need to add some energy. And this is like when the diver jumps off the diving board. Where does the energy come from? We call it activation energy. And in explosives, it's really, really easy, right? You take a little electrical current or a tiny shock wave, and you use it to ignite a fuse head, and that gets things going, and it's all great. But in our lives, this activation energy is courage. And courage is like a muscle. We build it up through continued use and through building on bigger and bigger things. But courage is deeply personal too. So what's terrifying to me is going to be a piece of cake for this guy. So you've mixed your skills and your passions together into this great little Molotov cocktail. You've been building up your courage and you press the go button. What can you expect? So an explosion is just a rapid expansion of matter from a solid or a liquid state to a gaseous one. And during that expansion, what happens is all of that potential energy is released. So when you blow up your life, expect just that. A rapid expansion, a disruption of everything you know and hold dear, a period of uncertainty when you're not going to know if you've made the right decision or not, and a period of time where everything in your world is new and terrifying and, and awful, and now you're thinking, 
Blowing up my life sounds like the worst idea ever, but why would I even consider it? But stick with me, because what happens next is the dust starts to settle. You start to see the new contours of the landscape and the new possibilities all around you. You see that your perfectly planned detonation did exactly what you wanted it to, and that your rigorous risk assessment meant the things that inevitably did get broken weren't the things that mattered the most to you, and maybe they were even reinforced by the shockwave from the blast. What you've done by taking this reaction to completion is you've taken all of those skills and those passions that were bottled up inside you. You've applied courage to them, and you've gotten them out of you and into the real world. You've unleashed your awesomeness. So when you leave here tonight, go back into the real world out there, are you going to keep walking around with your skills and your passions bottled up inside of you? Or are you going to give them a good shake, throw in some courage, and blow up your life? This is a picture of my wife and I the day we sold our car. We love not having a car, but I'm not here to tell you that you should sell your car, and I'm not here to tell you that cars are bad. I'm not here to guilt you about your carbon footprint. Instead, I'm here to talk about the secrets of multimodal transportation and the magic of going places without your car. Because the thing is, every mode of transportation has its own strengths. And they're a lot of fun. And if you're limiting yourself to only a car, you're missing out on a whole lot of value. So consider selling your car, but trying something else. Let me put it another way. If you were to tell a six-year-old to go grocery shopping for the week, <laughs> you're going to eat a cart full of ice cream, right? Most of us here are adults, and we do not do that. But not because we unlearned to like ice cream, and not because we decided at some point that ice cream is bad. Instead, we decided ice cream has a particular role in our lives, a very good one, but not an all-encompassing one. And that is, I think, the way to approach transportation. So let's look at the status quo. If you need to go somewhere right now, you're too busy thinking about what you're going to do when you get there, if you're late or not, what you're going to wear. You don't want to waste brain power thinking about how to get there. You just go to the default. It's a habit. I want to use that same whatever you want. Read a book, check your phone, reply to those emails. After a while, you're going you're gonna to see what I was saying at the beginning. Every mode of transportation has its strengths. Um, use that to your advantage. Don't limit yourself to only riding a car. Getting from, place, from point A to point B eventually becomes like a game. Um, you have so many options at your disposal. Um, you can choose a bike, a bus. You can learn to skirt around traffic. You can avoid parking, whatever you want. Transportation is an experience, right? We shouldn't hide ourselves away for a car and just wish for that terrible commute to be over, that terrible trip to be over, the hassle of parking. It's an experience. And the more and more you do this, the more confident you get. It starts to snowball a little bit, and you might adventure out and try a farther trip. Or maybe you'll try to bike on the road when you weren't comfortable doing that before. It's limiting to only use a car. And you'll begin to realize that the places around you affect who you are. You'll see these patterns emerge in your life of the places you go and the way that you, uh, the way that you go to get there. If you only see your life 23 days a year through a little glass rectangle, you're missing out on a whole lot. Because where you live and the place you live, there's a lot more there that you probably are missing out on if you aren't able to get out and experience it in different ways. When I tell people I don't have a car, the first reaction oftentimes is, well, I give it up, but I gotta get to the mountains. You take your car to the mountains, but realize that when you're there, the reason you love the mountains is because you can get outside your car and move around in tons of ways. You can ski, you can kayak, you can bike. You don't have to give that up when you're in Denver. All you need to do is leave your keys on the table. Thank you very much. So I live at 88th and Wadsworth. <laughs> <laughs> He's at 
give you a second. Good talk. Okay. <laughs> Name.com. They have been an amazing sponsor for us for I don't even know how long. So if you need web hosting needs or a new domain name, by all means, please. Probably be here, but he's in Ireland drinking beer. So fuck him, Jared. <laughs> <laughs> Our next speaker tonight is going to be Adrian Navarros. Uh, he explained to me that if he was uh, able to go back to being a kid, I almost knocked that over with my foot. Um, He'd be able to spontaneously take adventures. Not in a car. Uh, also, he, he said it's really important not to settle for mediocre, which I think is extremely important. This presentation, by the way, is so unique. Get yourselves ready for something a little bit different with Adrian. Come on out. Thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Tonight I'm going to be bringing you a sliding uh, story within each slide. So hold on to your buckle, your belly may chuckle. <laughs> Holding the bottle. This reminds me of a scene from Cask of Amontillado. This guy's on, on the other side of the wall, so does that make him Fortunato? Sorrow doesn't want a gag reflex, it wants him to swallow. If I ran the horse show, I'd put grandpa in tow and make grandma mow. Fuel's low, drunk like a skunk, I think I'ma call the tavern and ask for mo. Cow mowed on a hard road. Conflict looks bad. Congress be bad. We all know because there's beef down that road. <laughs> roll pants, do a dance. On a roll, take a chance. But her socks, you get no glance. But at least she has rolled pants. Slacker slacks, with a hat and no slacks. This guy's sending the wrong message, yet he's not sending a message. I guess you could say he doesn't slack. <laughs> Reflected row, guy in tow refuses to row. His courage is underwater next to row, while the guy up ahead reflects on his row. <laughs> Teacup sits, C cups fit. This is one steamy cup of tea you don't want to miss. <laughs> Up goes Hike Cheeks. Surprise! There goes Pike's Peak. <laughs> Puckered lips. Look at them falling in love. I call that a suckered kiss. Soon they'll have tuckered lids from screaming kids. <laughs> don't believe me? Who wants to take the first bid? Hand on plaid. He's just been told he's a new dad. <laughs> he's not sure if he's glad or sad, but he knows in one year, he'll be wiping a baby's ass. <laughs> hug hair, hug there. In focus goes hugging hair. No teddy bear. Teddy bear got pissed, little girl left him, so he went and left him there. On the fence? Nah, he just wanted something a little more dense. There's no Kent in that flint, so there's Superman's not making a dent, but Superman's piss. This guy's wondering where Lois went. <laughs> Bullwinkle's revenge, moose on the loose, balls hanging like a noose. <laughs> Inside their throats, writing notes, Natasha and Boris gag and choke. Sunrise on a fun high. She's in the Rockies, and I think we all know why. <laughs> KFC hired and fired her, all because she exposed the thigh. <laughs> Toffee skin, drinking coffee again. Wait, I think this dude could be my next of kin. He thinks he's drinking from a coffee cup, purchased from the bargain bin. Walking shoes, walking to a balking muse. 
He's about to get his blue jean ass chewed. <laughs> rubber shoes, concrete chews. Make up sex, rubber chews. Dame on window pane. Is she in pain or is it feigned? Did she lose the wedding rank? Nah, she just found out that her husband was Lord of the Bangs. He cut the neighbor's hair and trimmed the bangs. Bay, what can I say? This dude sat there so long, his hair turned gray. He's pretty obedient. He sat there and the bench said, stay. In a holy place, I don't think he exfoliates. Repenting from unholy dates, is it a bit late? Perhaps, what's in his lap? I hope it's not the clap. Let's say a prayer for this dear old chap. Thank you for coming out. Honest to God, you guys, when he was about to come out, I said, so do you want the mic in hand or on the stand? <laughs> that was me! <laughs> which makes it cooler. Uh, <laughs> Tom's our next guy that's going to be coming up. Right before I came out here, I had to ask him if it was Grover like the Muppet or Groover like the dance. And uh, in case you're wondering, uh, Tom, uh, he said that if he was going to have an autobiography, he would name it Doctoring the Inner Doctor. And yeah, that's deep. And uh, when I asked him what makes him the happiest, he said it was being happy. Mm. I live at 88th and Wadsworth. Yay! Uh, <laughs> so Tom's going to come out here and make y'all a bit smarter and feel free to groove along to his talk. So come on out, Tom! States issue corporations permits so they can legally force projects like oil and gas development and factory farming into our local communities. These permits give corporations the rights to violate the inalienable rights of people and communities, the rights to health, safety, and welfare, local community self-government, the right of nature to exist and flourish. And communities can't legally say no to these permits. Um, they can't say no to projects like the uh, fracking of Red Hawk Elementary School in Erie. It's because the states have created preemption. The states and corporations are able to use this tool. It's a legal doctrine that allows them to overturn the protective laws of local communities such as Greeley, Colorado's drilling ban and the bans of uh, Longmont, Fort Collins, Broomfield, and Lafayette are facing state preemption. Charged with protecting health, safety, and welfare, the Oil and Gas Commission really just promotes drilling, extraction, and transportation. The Summitville mine disaster killed the, the San Juan Mountains Alamosa River, poisoning it with heavy metals and cyanide. There was a ban, the, the five neighboring counties banned this uh, heat bleaching technology. And the uh, state of Colorado and uh, the Colorado Mining Association preempted that ban. Uh, the the Department of Agriculture, Governor Hickenlooper, the Department of Health and, and Environment, the State of Colorado, uh, Department of Agriculture, all banned Delta, Con Delta County's uh, factory chicken, chicken farming ban. So uh, now Delta County has exhaust from 120,000 chickens blowing disease to neighboring humans and animals. The state preempts minimum wage 
uh, greater than the state mandated uh, $8.23 per hour. Preempts local broadband and without a complicated voter referendum and prohibits communities from uh, using public funds to promote those referenda. Bans rent control. It banned, uh, it, it preempts rent, con rent control. It banned uh, uh, preempted uh, Telluride's rent control law and bans local plastic bag bans. Uh, preempts those as well, excuse me. So what I'm trying to say is that we don't really have a fracking, mining, uh, factory farming, minimum wage. We don't have all these problems. We have democracy problem here. Now, the Lafayette Community Bill of Rights claims the rights to health, safety, and welfare, the right to local self-government, and for nature to exist and flourish, and uh, bans fracking as a violation of those rights. Uh, that ban is uh, in danger of being preempted right now. Um, preemption protects corporate property and commerce, but violates fundamental rights of communities. So I suggest that we, uh, that we abolish preemption. And uh, so if you'll join our Colorado Community Rights Amendment campaign, uh, we can uh, get 150,000 signatures and uh, elect our amendment and uh, that way we will have uh, abolished state preemption so local communities will have the right to self-government to enact laws which protect them from corporate harms. So uh, you can contact me at uh, the contact us page of BullerChiropracticClinic.com and uh, I'll be happy to help you or your community any way I can. Thank you. Did you guys vote this week? Yeah. It's important. People like Tom initiate change, and I think that's amazing. Um, yeah, so yay voting and community involvement. Um, next speaker is coming up right now. His resting heart rate is at 107. He's got one of those little, you know, watches. And uh, when he comes out here, check his tie, because he was really worried about it being too short. He's going to be way pissed that I said this out here. He misses Power Rangers from when he was a kid, and the last picture he took of himself was dressed up as Walter White from Halloween. And uh, most importantly, uh, Matt prefers hugs to handshakes. Matt Holmes, everybody. <laughs> Ignite Denver, what's up? How we doing? Yeah! So I'm here to talk to you guys about my nightmare of student loans and just completely max out credit cards and lots of them. But um, before we go into that, I want to give you guys a little bit of contextual information. Um, first of all, I was lucky. I, I went to undergrad at DU and graduated without any significant loans. I studied psychology. Got an interest in entrepreneurship and figured, why not go get a master's degree in business, right? Ended up with $100,000 of student loans. And the message I'm here to tell you guys is that money might not be the thing stopping you from launching your startup. And it might. If it is, I'm here to convince you it's not. Um, hard entrepreneurship. Anyway, um, when I was going to school, I figured I better launch a business before graduating. Otherwise, I'm just going to be stuck interviewing, which is the same boat I was in when graduating undergrad. Um, launched a business halfway through. It was a real estate company. Uh, you know, it was... It, as long as it was slow, I wasn't really able to pay myself anything at all. Uh, it was called Holmes Real Estate Group because I didn't know how to name businesses back then. We basically took out-of-state investment and purchased single-family homes here in Denver, which we know the real estate's gone up, and we rented to people, young folks just like you and I that are moving here. And um, that's a real estate company. I, I spent 24 months paying myself $300 a month. Can anyone live off $300 a month? 
no. No, neither could I. But one thing I was good at was, was getting credit cards and getting high limits and maxing those out. And what I realized is the houses were appreciating. It was great news. The houses were worth more. And my credit card debt was also quickly rising. Every year I'd have quite a bit more, but I couldn't really access what was in the houses. And it wasn't always that much. So I started worrying about this credit card debt, and I started thinking, well, what's the worst that could happen? Um, I mean, I'm probably not going to end up in the cemetery, hospital, or jail, right? Three bad things. So, but, but there are some consequences, so let's talk about them. I mean, bad credit score, right? We're all scared about that. Uh, phone calls, you owe us money, Matt, pay up. Embarrassment, taking a date out to dinner, your card getting declined. Classic. And of, and of course, <laughs> we all know there's a lot of uh, high interest that you pay in the long run. So here's me kind of trying to balance student loans, which, by the way, were increasing because the interest, and that's a large amount. And here's credit cards each year, you know, 2,000, 25,000, mm, a little bit more. Um, so do you guys want to know the maximum amount, like the, the best? I, I, don't, I don't really want to talk about it. Uh, let me pause for a second, though. Creditkarma.com at the bottom here is a great resource I use to educate on credit and learn how I could eventually get $85,000 of credit card debt. But finally, things changed. Um, after those two years of not making any money on the real estate company, I ended up selling a condo that that real estate company owned and was able to pay off investors and actually have some cash to pay off the debt. Um, so I, I realized, wow, that was a crazy run. Entrepreneurship's insane. You can use credit to do that. But I didn't have a purpose. I wanted to find something a little bit more meaningful. So I focused on these things. I wanted to help other entrepreneurs. I wanted to write a book. Um, I wanted to find purpose. And so that's why I launched this next company. By the way, that's, that's my most recent book. If you guys want to check it out, Handshake and Your Way to Entrepreneurial Success, because the Handshake and Video Series is the new company I launched, where I interview top entrepreneurs um, on how networking and you know, psychology works, bringing it back to my undergraduate degree. It was sweet. We've interviewed venture, ca uh, venture capitalists, a billionaire, a member of Congress. Like, there's some insane stuff that works for networking if you're an aspiring entrepreneur. And uh, so, so final thoughts. Uh, an MBA can teach you how to balance debt, right? Like the curriculum was great, but you get to learn how to deal with $100,000 of student loans. And you don't have to risk the big things in life to launch your startup. You know, you don't have to risk the cemetery, hospital, et cetera. And, um, and one other point that I didn't get to fast enough. Anyway, would I max out again? Absolutely. A true shot at entrepreneurship is a big deal for you guys. And sometimes you just have to go for it. Don't risk the big things because you don't have to. And... Uh, Stop stopping yourself. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's something else. Do something big today. I want you guys to go out there after this event and do something. And I think a lot of you guys have a beer in hand, and now I have a microphone apparently. But um, let's raise like raise a hand for me. I need, I need each of you in the audience. Raise a hand if you're going to do something today to reach your goals. Come on, everyone. Yes. You guys are awesome. Yeah. Nothing will stop you from your dreams. Just do it. Just do it. Anyway, um, tweet me your startup idea, at Handshaken. I want to tell you if I like your name or not, and I want to support you. Launch your companies if you're thinking about it, and do something today. Thank you, guys. My Ignite. Dude's going to have a heart attack in like five minutes. It's like, what? wait, wait, Matt, what's it say on your thing? No? Oh, it's not working. Sad panda. <laughs> Debt is funny. No. <laughs> These are really important because they're messages evidently that I'm supposed to be getting that I don't. So thank God that I'm here listening to these things. Uh, Doyle, this is, this is going to be fun. So Doyle is doing, obviously, a very serious discussion. I came in braced for something really horrific, as I'm sure most people in this room are, will be, I don't know what verb I'm supposed to use. Breathe easy. This is not bad. <laughs> it's about a bigger picture. Now, let's talk about Doyle for a second. Doyle said that if he was to get an autobiography written, it would be called Jackass Duds Good. Um, if he could live in any sort of fictional world, it would be Dune. 
And uh, he, it's funny, so on the email, I don't know crap about Dune other than Tina Turner. That's all I know. And, uh, and he put on there, I want to be, I'm going to mispronounce this shit out of this, the Kwisatz Haderach, or something like that. And I'm like, well, I should try and say this on stage. He said, no, just tell everybody I want to be Paul. The geeks will get it. Okay. All right. So he wants to be Paul. <laughs> And, uh, and he's going to come out here and talk to you about something much bigger than Dune, although Dune's pretty important. So please bring uh, a lot of applause for Doyle. I wanted to do something about gun violence. When I thought about the enormity of the problem... I felt paralyzed. There are thousands of people gunned down in this country every year. 2014 was a record-breaking year for gun violence in, in schools. It was also the year my son was born. I couldn't sit back any longer. I had to do something. But who am I? What can I do? I'm a school teacher. I'm nobody. And then I had this idea that it didn't matter <laughs> who I am. It doesn't matter what I do for a living. It just matters what I can do. So I decided I would give away all of my skills and talents for free. Anything I could do from screwing in a light bulb, installing a toilet, to helping with an essay. And then people would be inspired, and they'd want to pay it forward, and then the world would be a better place. I made flyers, I went door to door, and nobody wanted my help. <laughs> I went back to my classroom, I told my students, they love the idea. I told their parents at back to school night, they love the idea. But nobody wanted my help. And it started to feel like there was this giant wheel of fortune just spinning round and round. And it only stopped when it landed on somebody else's kid. But they're not somebody else's kids. They're my kids. They're our kids. And I wanted to quit. At the same time, I had this, this student, John, driving me insane. He's constantly interrupting. He's shouting across the room, oh, that's a neck. Meaning somebody's going to get slapped in the neck because they said something stupid. <laughs> and then I'm teaching one day, and I hear, oh, Mr. Hanks, you know that's a neck. <laughs> I'd had it. I march him outside. I read him the right act. And he's got this tear coming down his cheek. And he's t he tells me his mother's very sick, and suddenly it all makes sense. I put a hand on his shoulder. I tell him, I'm sorry. I'm there for him, and I understand. Now, he and I, things are different between us after that. <laughs> he's, the guy, he's the guy telling the other kids to be quiet now. He tells me he wants to start a kindness club on campus based on my idea, and he's a born leader. He writes a charter. He, at the first meeting, he's like, all right, you're president, you're vice president, you're secretary, you're treasurer, boom, let's do this. <laughs> and he stops coming to meetings. I hear through the grapevine that he's been in some fights. He emails me and he tells me, Mr. Hanks, I am not kind. I don't deserve to be part of something great. I email him back and I tell him, you are great, and you come back as soon as you're ready. But he doesn't come back. In fact, he doesn't come to my class at all. And I start to think about the limiting beliefs that this kid has that tell him that he's unworthy at 15. And then I realize I'm doing the exact same thing with my project, thinking that I don't deserve to make a difference. And I wonder if he's comparing himself to me, thinking that I'm a good person because I'm doing this project. I am not a good person. I am mean and spiteful and petty, and if I have to wait to be good, to do good, then I am doomed. And I am a good person. Because it's about perspective, it's about what you choose. And I choose to be good in spite of what I think about myself. And then, I got somebody to partic participate in my project. First time. I installed a light fixture in this woman's kitchen, and it was awesome. It looked like the Death Star. <laughs> and, and I was thrilled, and she was thrilled, and her husband was thrilled because he didn't have to do it, and I was so happy. 
And I did a project after project, and I was so happy and so confident with each one. And I was fundamentally changed and completely a different person by giving. And I realized this project was never about what I give to other people. It was always about what I get from giving. I think that's the answer to gun violence. That if we can choose to give and connect and love, then the world will be a better place. And John did come back to class. And something did change for him because he got an A in my class. And on the last day of school, he hugged me and he thanked me. And I thanked him right back. And I'd like to thank you. And if you need any help with anything, just let me know. Jesus, I was about to say I made it through the first half of the show without face planning. That's what I get about thinking about stuff like that. Hi guys, I'm just going to sit down. <laughs> Congratulations, you guys. You've made it to intermission. Uh, I only nearly broke an ankle, so that's cool. And uh, I believe, is Biker Jim still out there? Yes. You can still get some more wieners. Uh, we got a bar right over there. Hey, buddy. <laughs> You guys got about 15 minutes. Uh, we will see you back here. Thank you so much.
All right, Ignite Denver, y'all having a good time tonight? I know, we're just playing some of that background, weird, jazzy stuff. Who gives a shit? Anyway, this next one's called Heartbreaks Beat. We're going to get some more people talking quite soon. Ignite. I think we got time for one more before intermission ends. So thanks so much for listening. We're Dan Du. We've got Ben Wyrick on the keys. Yeah. Dylan Johnson on the drums. And I'm Sean Dandran on the bass.